Well, folks, here we go again. Ladies and gentlemen, the Republican candidates for President of the United States. With the 2012 presidential election just 14 months away. I simply want to get America working again. The Republican challengers. This is just flat out wrong. Are off and running. America's economy is in crisis. With unemployment above 9% and the economy reeling. Our debt has gone up nearly triple. They're lining up for a shot at the White House that they believe is up for grabs. But as the candidates scuffle for attention, there's one would-be contender who turned heads and made headlines by choosing not to run. Mitch Daniels. Indiana's popular governor, Mitch Daniels. So you weren't teasing people that you were going to run for president, were you? Honestly, no. No, I wasn't. I think I irritated a lot more people because I didn't go for it. But um, I did look at it seriously eventually. And why not? Daniels is a rising star, a former advisor to President Reagan and George W. Bush's director of the Office of Management and Budget. I say let her rip. He was elected governor of Indiana in 2004 and turned around a struggling economy. The state was broke when we got here and we fixed that in a great big way. We have reshaped our economy here to be, by all accounts, one of the most attractive to investment and growth and opportunity in the country. We built roads at record rates and, and lowered property taxes to the lowest in the country and we, we made government work well. And he did it by slashing government spending and balancing the budget. One thing we've, I think, demonstrated here in Indiana, where we have fewer state employees than the state did in 1976, is uh, you'd be amazed how much government you'll never miss. Daniels seemed the perfect presidential candidate for these deficit-obsessed times. But when party leaders came calling, his response was stunning. I remember saying then verbally, it's this simple, I love my country, I love my family more. It was a remarkable concession for an ambitious public servant. Daniels and his wife Sherry have four daughters. When they sat down to discuss a presidential run, as the governor puts it, the women's caucus won. What were your concerns, Sherry? Well, I think our family was really concerned about the, the lack of privacy and that it's not just for four years or eight years, but for the rest of your life. You know, Mitch has given 12 years to public service and, you know, now, now it was our turn to get him back. I said to somebody, I said, there's, well, there's one sentence that, uh, for which a father has no reply, which is, Daddy, please don't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they really did not want you to run for president. That yeah. appeared to be the consensus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You seem a little emotional about that. Do you feel caught between being a father and a husband and pursuing something like a higher office where you feel like you could really make a difference? No, I mean, I'm not complaining about a thing. I'm the luckiest guy uh, I know of. And, uh, you know, but you can't have everything in life and sometimes you have to choose. But political insiders whispered there was another reason. Daniels wasn't running, they said, because he and his wife would face difficult questions about an intensely private episode in their marriage. Your marriage has been interesting. Most people have interesting marriages. What happened? Well, what happened was, uh, what, what happened was a happy ending. And uh, I always say, if you, if you love happy endings, you'll love our story. Their story is that after 15 years of marriage and four daughters, they divorced in 1993. Sherry moved out, briefly remarried, divorced her second husband, and then remarried Daniels in 1997. Sherry, you know people said that when um, you guys got divorced, the suggestion out there was that you had abandoned your four girls. Was that hurtful when people wrote that? Well, it was because it wasn't true. I didn't move to California. I lived within, what, a quarter of a mile of Something. the house. Mm -hmm. And so that simply didn't happen. They insist there are no dark secrets preventing him from running. Is this a middle age thing? No, I, I had my first one when <laughs> I was 21. I owned a bunch of them. Either way, Daniels isn't a candidate, but that doesn't mean he's going quietly.
Not running, he says, has its advantages. Among them, he's free to speak his mind about our nation's problems. What do you think about Governor Perry calling Social Security a Ponzi scheme? And it is a monstrous lie. It is a Ponzi scheme. As far as it goes, that's, he's not the first, and as far as it goes, that's not inaccurate. A Ponzi scheme is something where you take money from uh, people today, they may think they're investing, it's being given out the back door to somebody else. You agree with Governor Perry? Well, that's the, that is the structure of Social Security. There's no secret about that. Daniels doesn't shy away from controversy. In Indiana, he's been called anti-union for restricting collective bargaining. He passed a law withdrawing funds for abortion providers, and he angered immigration rights groups by fining employers who hire illegal immigrants. What matters is not winning the next election. It is acting while there's still time to save our republic. America, he says, has some tough choices to make, and he discusses our problems and offers some possible solutions in a new book, Keeping the Republic. I read this book and I was scared. Is that what you meant it to do, to scare people? For the country? Yeah. Yes, people ought to be scared. If we don't make changes, we will ruin the American project. And by that I mean that the dream that, that has attracted millions to these shores, that a person can start with nothing and rise to the top. He's worried that our staggering debt, if unchecked, could signal the beginning of America's decline. There is a long, clear history of nations rising to greatness and leadership and then falling. And, and interestingly, I quote a historian who says, it always starts with the money. You know, first they spend themselves into a corner, borrow themselves into a corner, and, and the rest of the of the fall, uh, uh, flow, including military defeat sometimes, flows from that. Well, thanks for coming back. And Daniel says we urgently need to balance our nation's books. Good job. That's a, that's a good result. As he did in Indiana, by taking big government out of the equation and letting free enterprise take over. I think the, the important uh, part of life, the heart of American society, is the private sector. It's what it, government should be there to, to in, not to dominate it and to dictate to it, make all the decisions, but to, to do those things we have to do together to, to make private life flourish. Next time I see you, maybe it's a single digit, huh? Sit in on a few meetings with him, and his focus on the bottom line is hard to miss. So you cut it in half. That's good. You've been working. Whether he's tackling an environmental project, welfare reform, or child protection. That way you'd be steadily raising the bar. For now, he'll continue working on Indiana's problems. And as for what the future may hold, while he won't be our next president, who knows what the next phone call may bring. I always say that one day the phone rings and something interesting that seems useful mm -hmm. is on the other end. And to be I've vice president? Well, that wasn't, the that wasn't the call I was hoping for, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, uh, but you wouldn't rule that out? Oh, I don't. You don't rule anything out, I suppose.